Welcome back, guys, to the great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve, where last episode we shared what we had learned with Eugene Mikotoba, as Suzuto diverted Iris' attention away to allow us to talk about the topic of her possible father's death. At the end, a favor was asked of Ryunosuke to return to Japan at the case's end to practice law in the Supreme Court. With a decision to be made in the future, and after Shomes abruptly interrupted needing to send a telegram to Japan, we move over to the St. Sinner's Hospital to speak with Daily Vigil, learning of a last will and testament written by Genshin Asugi, referred to as the Asugi Papers, that we now head over to the prison to subtly, queerly, though I have no clue how we're supposed to do that. So yes, they told us to go to the prison, the prison's opened up, but it's the prison governor's office, not the prison, that we need to go to. So let's go inside. Yes, about these papers that no one knows about, that shouldn't exist, but we can't call them by those names, but yeah. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Did uh, Genshin Dasuki, I'll be the professor, leave a will behind? <laughs> How are we gonna approach this? Oh, back again, are ya? Uh, yes. Hello? I know all about your investigations. I read the report just now. You found him, eh? Vigil. Yes, luckily. Well, anywho. The laddie doesn't they work here anymore. So your case is not to do with partly. I wouldn't have liked you to get the wrong idea about that. Of course, yes. Mr. Vigil stopped working here ten years ago now, so... Yes, we've seen this dismissal notice, haven't we? He was given the chop. Aye, Kira, you came very well. So, how about we handcuff Biscuit? Oh, they really are like little handcuffs and as hard as irons too. So, what sport are you doing the other day? Well, there's something else we'd like to ask you about, actually. Is that so? We believe there might have been a document that disappeared from Genjin Asuki's cell. I think it's been called the Asuki Papers or something. We just straight out said it. Dumbass. Guess there's no other way, really. Did I no say? Gregson's death is not to do with things that might have happened at Bartley. Leave the past in the past, laddie. Let's not fool her about with irrelevant details. His expression has changed completely. We're clearly onto something here. Oh, yeah, so now we would just bother him some more. That'll work. Ten year old legacy. That murderer's botched execution. And the old miserable escape. They were Bartley's dark as day, aye. A shocking embarrassment. Because the convict had a collaborator on the prison staff, you mean. Aye. A shame. The coroner who confirmed the death of the man after his execution, Courtney Scythe. And my chief warder at the time, Vigil. Who was in charge of the whole affair. But Mr. Vigil says he didn't know anything about it. The rascal wouldn't say otherwise, eh? And more handcuffs. Oh, how could I say no? You can never have too much iron in your diet. When Mr. Vigil was handed his dismissal notice as a result of what had happened, he was so despairing, he jumped out of your office window, didn't he? I didn't like to say, but that's just Vigil trying to get out of it. Do you not think he wouldn't have jumped from the shock of his crimes being exposed, eh? I do. You wouldn't have say otherwise, though, would you? Of course, I kind of shun all responsibility myself. I shouldn't have let him deceive me. Actually, there's barely anybody that kens what went on at, at that time now. But Gregson haven't been murdered and Dr. Sai forbidden from having any visitors. No visitors? Someone obviously doesn't want her giving anything away. Well, we're not going home empty-handed. And I wouldn't have dream of sending you packing win out, Kimma. Here, take a handcuff or two. Oh, well, it would be rude to say no. Wouldn't want to become anemic. I suppose if there's anybody who might still care about what happened back then. It'd be that last from the forensic division. Maria Gori. Maria Gori? Aye, oh, Seif's daughter. Seif's. She didn't have no more, just the one. But the wee bands followed in her man's footsteps. Didn't they ever see her without a scalpel in her hand? Ah, yeah, the murderer. 
Not really the murderer, but you know, she's scary. Mama, what is this? Uh, where did she spring from? And did she just call the doctor Mama? Dr. Sive's daughter, Maria Gori. We could do with talking to her. Speak about it. So she's Dr. Sive's daughter, but her surname is Gori. Oh, there's some family history, I'm sure, but I didn't ken the ins and outs of it. She grew up watching a man working with the bodies of folk who died in strange circumstances. And decided to do the same with her own life. I kind of understand it myself. Perhaps she was driven by a deep respect for her mother. Perhaps. Anywho, she was in charge of Gregson's autopsy, I believe. Right, and the coroner responsible for this incomplete report. Someone told me once that the wee lassie always loved her ma'am's stories about cutting up bodies. There's even a rumour that she used to listen to the funeral march as a lullaby. Well then, perhaps her mother might have told her about the autopsy from the case ten years ago. Oh, I'd say there's a fine chance at least. After all, that was a life-changing case for all of us. We really need to speak to Miss Gorley herself about this, I think. Well, thank you very much. I'm not happy about any part of this. It took years for Londoners to finally forget the whole professor business. Can you not give up on this, laddie? Stop asking pointless questions. I'm sorry, I don't like dredging up these painful memories for everyone. Can you not just stay away, no? Leave me alone and did it come back here, eh? Well, let's just be more irritating to him. How'd you come to ken about that, laddie? There's no many folk even here in the prison who've heard of those papers. Ah, well, I can't tell him Mr. Vigil told me. I'm afraid our sources must remain confidential, sir. Ah. We've been led to believe the papers are actually a last will and testament. Is that right? The professors, or rather Genshin Asuki's. Aye, oh, that's right. You're well informed, Jimmy. Oh, is that the end of the silent treatment? But then after the convict's execution, it mysteriously vanished from his cell, didn't it? Others know, you're off at half cop there. I think you didn't quite get your facts straight. It was there in the cell, exactly where it should have been. Oh, not what we heard elsewhere. Let me just have a wee oak around here. I'm sure I can find it. Ah, oh, here you are. See? What? It's just here? The last will and testament of Genjin Asuki. Written with a calligraphy brush. Of course, I cannot read a word of those Japanese squiggles. But our miner says he leaves all his worldly possessions to his son back in his homeland. Yes, that's correct. That's the gist of it. So these are the Asagi papers. Aye, of course they are. Papers written by Asagi, no doubt about it. There's no mystery here, laddie. That's your lot. After all the star match of that Slayster of an execution. Slayster? We sent the man's possessions back to his clan in Japan, and that was the end of it. I think we ought to make a record of this, Mr. Nalahodo. Just in case. The Asagi papers have been entered into the court record. Apparently, Mr. Asagi described it as the only weapon I have left. One thing before you go on your way, Mr. Nalahodo. Oh, yes? Those papers are now to do with Gregson's death. I prefer it if you didn't make no mention of them outside this office. Or rather... I wouldn't just prefer it considering an order from the highest levels of our government. I understand. Okay. Can I actually look at these then? I, Genshin Asagi, hereby request that upon my death, any and all material possessions and wealth belonging to me in London be delivered to my son, Kazuma Asogi, in the Empire of Japan. It is with deep sadness that I accept my fate in this foreign land, in the knowledge that I will never see my homeland or family again. 
But I regret nothing about my chosen path. One possession made it, right? At least one. Well, is that really all we have here? Can I actually examine this nail? You wouldn't let me do it before. An axe, a hunting rifle. Oh no, wait a second. It was all of the stuff. And four pair of handcuffs. That's a dawning collection. Ah, there's a story behind every one of those. You mean, the rifle was a famous killer's murder weapon and the axe was wielded by an infamous executioner. And handcuffs were once used to immobilize a fierce four-legged beast when it was arrested. I think you're in the realms of fancy now, Mr. Nanahodo. Not those kind of stories, Jimmy. That axe was the one I used to chop down the cherry tree at my house. Mrs. Caden was no best pleased. Ah. Uh, and the cuffs on the left are the ones I caught my first burglar with back when I was a bobby. The stories were a little different to those you imagined, I think, weren't they? Yes, to my relief, and in some small way, my disappointment. What about the parrot, then? I never have expected to find a parrot in a prison. It must be the governor's pet. Given where we are, it's hard not to see the poor creature as a prisoner. Let me out! <laughs> Did it kill me? Ha! Ah! <laughs> That's exactly what I expected to say. Uh, uh, has the bird learned to mimic the plaintive cries of the inmates in the cells? Oh, nah. He was one of three siblings, you see. And he still calls out the names of his two brothers like that all the time. Those are his names. Right. Let me out! Did he kill me? Aye, aye. Aye, you laddie. You want your dinner, eh? Didn't they do it? What? It just reminds me of the one time I talked to a Furby. And I've probably said this story like a billion times over various Let's Plays. But the only words I got out of it in English were, please don't kill me. And I was like, what the hell are these people doing with these Furbies? What the hell are these people doing? I suppose these are all former governors of Buckley Prison, are they? Either that or former inmates who the governor has sent to the gallows. Oh dear, they all have such severe expressions. I really couldn't deny either possibility. Especially the one on the extreme right. His expression goes beyond severe into a whole new territory. That one's me. Ah! I'm, I'm terribly sorry, sir. Is it a prerequisite of the job, perhaps? Having a severe expression, I mean. Of course it's not. Although it is taken into consideration. A lot. I think we should keep examining his room. That's a very large cabinet full of papers, isn't it? It's labelled Inmate Register. Look. And all the files are in alphabetical order. That's 50 years worth of records of Bartley's inmates. Whether or not they left alive after serving their term. All the details about the crimes they committed are recorded in there, like an epitaph, you might say. A record of crimes and punishments. How dispiriting. And yet... This man seems to be enjoying tea and biscuits as he talks about it. Okay, let's leave it at that then, shall we? Oh, we haven't done the clock! Th this grandfather clock is... is fitted with a terrifying blade that keeps dropping down. It's modeled on the guillotine, a French execution device. You might have heard of it. And yes, before you ask, it can chop. Heads off, heads off you mean? Ah, there's no carrots and parsnips and so forth. Oh. If you place a large carrot at the bottom there in the morn, by evening it'll have been cut clean in two. Well, the blade must have an almost indescribable edge on it then. <laughs> Barely anything. You look for it's pulping. Pulping! That's the window that someone jumped out of. Right, uh, cheers for the information, I guess. You were more obliging than I thought you'd be. Uh, where do we go next? So, prison, prison, yeah, yeah. That's the last spot, isn't it? How do I speak to Maria Gory? This is your office, is it? Given an office already. I guess it's just maybe the communal prosecutor's office? 
Now you've just been given his office. So this is the office of Prosecutor Asogi now, is it? Kazuma-sama is doing so well for himself. Even though he's always forced to kneel on the floor, Japanese style in that dark corner. It's his habit of sit Caesar style. It's his habit to sit Caesar style whenever he's working. It hurts. Kazuma. He's got a nice pillow, I guess. I thought it wouldn't be long before you pay me a visit, Ryanosuke. I was right about what I said, wasn't I? Sorry. That you have all the makings of a great defense lawyer. Well, I always believed that you fulfill your dream of advocating in the British courts. I just never imagined for one second that it would be as a prosecutor. Seeing you stand in a foreign courtroom, so gallantly realizing your dream, Kazuma-sama, I'm truly happy for you. And I'm truly thankful to you, Judicial Assistant Mikotoba. Runosuke, I always thought it would be fun for you and I to shake up the British legal system a little together. This isn't quite how I envisaged it, but I suppose it's just another twist of fate. I've learned a lot of things during my time in London. Bad houses of San's father was himself a visiting student here once, along with Judge Ch Chigoku. And about what happened with your father. Then you'll have no difficulty understanding why I had no choice. Why I had to find a way to get to Britain as a visiting student myself. I want to hear it from you, Kazuma. As you wish, Runosuke and Nalahodo. I will continue to speak to him while, if you haven't figured, there haven't been any noise, being distracted all episode by my cat who keeps buzzing around my office. <laughs> Just clawing at the carpet right now, looking exceptionally cute, I thought I'd tell you. Your disappearance. It's getting on for a year now. Since what happened on the SS Berlia. We were heading across the oceans from Japan to Great Britain. When a bizarre series, series of coincidences. Well, yes, when a bizarre series of coincidences. When a bizarre series of coincidences led to those tragic events. I thought I'd lost my best friend forever. I must have been unconscious for a long time. When I awoke, I was lying on a bed. It was a narrow little room. There was a posy of flowers by the pillow. It took me a little while to realize that I was in the cabin of a ship. I slipped out of the room and headed up onto the deck. Were you already suffering from amnesia at that point? Yes, I didn't know what had happened or where I was. There was just this voice in my head. You have something you have to do. Something no one else can know about. Go to Great Britain. Your task awaits you there. It was a calling I couldn't ignore. It compelled me relentlessly. Out on deck, I saw that I was on a huge steamship and we were docked in a large port. It must have been Hong Kong. Yes, it must have been. Presumably just before they were due to carry your body off the ship. I had no idea of the situation, but I did have the feeling that this was in some way my last chance. So I concealed myself among the disembarking passengers and went ashore. Then I disappeared into the crowded streets of that foreign poor city. So I could plan my onward journey to Great Britain. Just under a year ago, with all my past memories lost to me, I was left behind in Hong Kong. Everything was foreign to me. The sights, the sounds... The smells, my head reeled, I was truly at a loss. I realize now that I'd escaped as a dead man, with nothing but the clothes on my back. No money, of course. Oh, how terrifying for you. Luckily though, I had two feathers in my cap. One being your knowledge of English, I suppose. That's right. And on the back of that, I was able to pick up some work as a deckhand on a cargo ship. Eventually, after calling at countless ports, I finally arrived at Dover. 
That must have been some three months ago now. Your formidable tenacity of purpose showing itself again. I mean, the man had lost his memory and had literally nothing to his name. But he still managed to make his way to London on the opposite side of the world. Of course, I had no idea why I'd moved heaven and earth to get here at that point. So, how did you end up becoming Lord Van Zeke's apprentice then? That can only be called an extraordinary stroke of luck, really. You see, I was stopped at the border because I had no papers. They took me straight to Scotland Yard. And by sheer coincidence, Lord Strongheart was there to attend a meeting. That's when the second feather in my cap came into play. Would that have been your knowledge of the law? Yes, exactly. Lord Strongheart was curious about an Easterner with intimate knowledge of British law. He took me back with him to the Supreme Court and assigned me to the prosecutor's office. And then, nine days ago... You finally got your memory back after the trial involving Drebba. Yes, I did. So about your father. Ever since I first met you, Yume, you talked about your dream. Mark my words, Rinosuke. I'll be chosen as a visiting student and make my way to Great Britain someday. Did you know the entire time about what happened to your father here? Sixteen years ago. When my father left on that exciting trip to Great Britain, I was just a boy. We took a photograph together the day before his departure. It's my last memory of him. What I remember most about my father is his unswerving sense of justice. Six years after he left, a gentleman called at our family home. He told me that Genshin, my father, had been taken ill in England and passed away. It was Professor Mikotoba, your father, Susado-san. Oh my! Ever since then, the professor was very good to me. He even helped to fund my university education at Yume. I'll be forever in his debt. But nevertheless, I just couldn't bring myself to believe what he told me. Oh. Then one day, a letter arrived at our house from Britain. There was no indication of the sender, so I opened it assuming it was from an old acquaintance of my father. What I read in that letter changed my entire life. What did it say? It said that my father had been a mass murderer, and the writer cursed the Asogi name. Oh no! As a result of that letter, I found out what had been hidden from me all those years. A letter from Britain. Presumably the letter was sent from a relative of one of the victims. If whoever it was had been a member of the judiciary, he could have been present at the closed trial. The letter revealed that my father had been sentenced to death, executed for being a killer. I'm, I'm so sorry you had to find out that way. I imagine the British government did its very best to silence whoever sent that letter. But someone who knew the truth and couldn't bear the resentment was always going to be a problem. But still, it... It could have been written by anyone. Why would you believe such a thing? There was a newspaper cutting included with the letter. It was the first I'd ever heard of the professor and his terrible killing spree. Well, what did my father have to say about the letter? I couldn't bring myself to show it to him. What? Why not? As he deliberately concealed the truth from me by telling me my father was taken by a fatal illness. That couldn't have been easy for him. And he'd done it out of consideration for my feelings. So instead, I showed the letter to Judge Jigoku. Ah, to the other visiting student. He folded for the briefest of moments, but then he just laughed the letter off. But in that moment, I saw it on his face. He was undeniably shocked. Shaken momentarily before recovering his poise. A year later, my bereaved mother succumbed to the strain of grief, and she too passed away. That's when I made up my mind that one day, without fail, I would cross the seas to Britain and seek the truth for myself. 
The truth about my father, Genshin Asagi. And I wouldn't let anyone stand in my way. Oh, Kazuma-sama. What we learned today in court turned things completely on their head. It was an impressive piece of lawyering, Rinosuke and Nadahodo. Well, man, Zeke's isn't the Reaper, you know. I almost don't want to believe it myself, but it turns out that Inspector Gregson himself, the victim, was... It's clear that the Inspector was behind the Reaper's activity all along. What? You mean, you knew? The real question is, who's been giving orders to the Inspector? Yes, Balak Van Zeeks is the real Reaper. And I know that ten years ago, it was him who decided my father must be a mass murderer and send him to his grave. No, he was merely seeing that justice was done as the law dictates. He's not to blame. Ultimately, it's people who condemn people. The law is just a tool they use to do it. And when a man condemns another, he must take responsibility for his actions. Of course he must. But I know for certain that my father would never have taken another man's life. Kazuma. On the contrary, my father's life was taken by the Reaper. Is that really where we end with that? No, because we're not being told to move on or anything. There's definitely a thing to do here. Just looking. Right, we need to answer to some questions. And we obviously need to speak to a certain someone. What questions can you answer for us? Oh, I could present him this. But I think I see the link where we need to go already. Kazuma, what do you make of this? There's only one place where defense lawyers and prosecutors should discuss evidence. The courtroom. So it seems you're still confused by the situation. That's what I make of it. I get the feeling my friend's always going to have the edge over me, isn't he? Actually straight up denied it. Right, so if that's definitely not it, which I didn't think it would be anyway, we need to, uh... We need to learn more. We need to meet the coroner. Maria Gori. We need to learn the time of death. We need to just be able to get there. Please? This came up in the trial, didn't it? As something a little dubious, I mean. The fact that no time of death was recorded on Inspector Gregson's autopsy report. Yes, there were some unexpected turns in the courtroom earlier. The suggestion you came up with certainly took everyone by surprise. The idea that the victim died the previous day at some other location is quite something. Well, considering when the pocket watch had stopped and the scorch marks on the candle, it's certainly a distinct possibility. The evidence in the scene both point to it. To be honest, it bothered me too. So I paid a visit to the autopsy room earlier. The coroner responsible wasn't there, but I got a name. It's Dr. Gori. Um, if it wouldn't trouble you, Kazuma-sama, we'd very much like to speak with the coroner too. Of course, the last thing I want is for anything to be brushed under the carpet. Scotland Yard's autopsy laboratory is behind Lowgate Cemetery. Lowgate Cemetery By Barclay Prison, you mean? Ah, you know it, do you? The prison where my father was incarcerated and robbed of his life. Kazuma-sama. Well, thank you. We'll pay a visit to the laboratory later today. Rinosuke. I want to thank you. What for? For this, you safeguarded the soul of the Asogi clan. Well, it is a famous sword that's been in your family for generations. 
My only slight regret is that I never got the chance to draw it before I returned it to you. Kanama is said to have been forged by a master swordsmith during the Sengoku Warring States period. I come from a long lineage of warriors, many of whom were expert swordsmen. Well then, you're a chip of the old block, I'd say. This blade, Kalama, is a symbol of the Asugi clan's honor and might. Apparently, one of my father's apprentices even took the blade's name for a surname. Really? Kalama? It does sound formidable, that's for sure. Sixteen years ago, when my father was a visiting student here in London, he had this sword forever at his side. Which is why it means so much to me that I have it by my side again now too. And that is all thanks to you. It was an honor. Now, I have preparations to make for tomorrow. Perhaps I said a little too much. Kazuma, you've changed. No, Ryanosuke, I haven't changed at all. It's you who's changed. I can completely understand your resentment of Lord Van Zeke's given what happened. But the fact is, those events in this case are, well, unrelated. Is that what you want to say? How can you be so sure? What do you mean? Never mind. That man is the Reaper, and it's for that reason that the Inspector was killed. I'm going to prove as much in court tomorrow. By whatever means necessary. I can't let you do that, Kazuma. I know you'll do what you have to do as a lawyer, but I'm sure I don't need to tell you that I won't be taking any prisoners in the courtroom. I would expect nothing less. Until tomorrow then, in the Old Bailey. Until tomorrow then. As my cat has now completely blocked my vision of the screen, I don't know if you've been able to hear it, but she's been right next to the microphone throughout the entire last 15 minutes. <laughs> As we bring to the end, this is the weirdest filming scenario I've gotten to, uh, bring to the end another episode of The Great Ace Attorney to Resolve. Hopefully now we have passage to speak to Maria Gori. We've been told the location, so we should be able to get there. I mean, we've been there once before. Why couldn't we have gone there ourselves? But of course, it's always the case of permission, isn't it? Thankfully, if it wasn't through him, it was going to be through Mel. And we got it. So now we continue on next time. And I better go feed my cat. I'll see you guys then for more. Bye-bye.